Now, I've been thinking about that word expectations. It's not a word that we um, like very much in today's day and age. I've been doing uh, a bunch of work with local nonprofits lately on hiring practices, and there's a, a few that are talking through how they've been doing these um, employee surveys, and a lot of the questions on the surveys are kind of, they're really along the line of like, what kind of place would you like to work at? How would you like to do your job? How would, and, I, and I started to feel really old, you know? Because I was like, that just doesn't make sense to me. Shouldn't we just say this is the expectation of your employment? And people are like, it doesn't work anymore. And I go, reject that. <laughs> and just say, if you'd like to work here, you don't have to work here. These are the expectations of working here. And then give them the choice of whether or not to work here. I mean, it seems like, and that's kind of what we've been going through in the Sermon on the Mount, right? The attitudes and the actions, and we'll see today the attributes that we must have, that must be if we are to continue to be disciples of Jesus. I mean, he's just laying it out for us. You don't have to continue to be a disciple of Jesus. But if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, these are the expectations of being a disciple. Now, along with that, um, I did work with another nonprofit, and there was, um, there was a, a particular hire that they made for a particular position that had a particular job description. And, and I was working with the executive director, and they had talked about how this person was struggling with fulfilling their job description. And so they asked me to go and have a conversation with them. And so I was sitting down to have the conversation with them, and I asked them two questions. I just said, is it that you find yourself unable to fulfill your job description, or is it that you're unwilling to fulfill your job description? Because if you're unable and you're just struggling with it because you're nervous about it and you don't feel like you're equipped to do it, we will pour into you everything you need, every bit of training and resources and, and, and equipping and, and empowerment that you could possibly need to do what you've been called to do, what you've been employed to do. But if, on the other hand, you're unwilling to do what you've been employed to do or called to do, well, then that's a different conversation, isn't it? And this person looked at me and said straight up, I am unwilling to do it. And I said, well, then maybe your decision's clear. And I think that's the, that's the searching question for us as we're going through the expectations of discipleship. Is it that you're just struggling? You read these attitudes, you read these actions, you read these expectations, and you're like, oh, that's just not in me. Ah, what do I do now? Well, is it that you're unable, but you want to be able? Well, how much more so? Would Jesus say to us, I will pour into you not only all of the equipping. Remember, God equips the called. He doesn't call the equipped. I will pour into you not only all the training, like everything is training for something else, but I will also pour into you the power of my Holy Spirit so that you can do what I've called you to do. I would never call you to do something that I didn't already intend to empower you to do. So are you struggling because you feel unable? Or are you struggling because you've chosen to be unwilling? And the expectation remains. If you want to continue to be a disciple of Jesus, these are the expectations. You don't have to continue to be a disciple of Jesus. So when you're wrestling with this in your heart, there's the litmus test. Is it that you're unable but want to or unwilling and you would walk away like they did in John chapter 6, where it said fewer and fewer were following Jesus. I have this curiosity question. Are there more or less people on the mountain at this point in the sermon? And I think the, the instant answer would probably be less. But look around. We've had some tough sermons, haven't we? You might have come today to this Sunday and be like, oh, there's going to be like four people next Sunday. <laughs> and yet, for those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus, we want these things to be in our life, right? We want these to be our attitudes. We want these to be our actions. We just feel ill-equipped. 
And then we sense that if we look to Jesus and we say, change me, Jesus, I've turned towards you, please help me, that he will, according to his promise, pour out his Holy Spirit upon us and help us with this. Okay, that was the sermon before the sermon. Let's go. All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for laying this out clearly for us, the expectations of discipleship. Help us, Jesus. We're still here. We're still listening. We're still your servants. We want to follow you with our whole heart. We want to see these things happen in our lives. And we know that it's not going to be another New Year's resolution or an effort of the human will, but it's going to be a work of your Holy Spirit. So help us, change us, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. We all say, amen. So a sermon on a mountain with fishermen and farmers, telling them what their attitudes and actions must be if they want to continue to be disciples of Jesus. We know that word disciple means a learner and a follower of Jesus. So what does it actually look like to be a learner and a follower of Jesus? Well, that's what this Sermon on the Mountain is is all about. Remember, he saw the multitudes. He left the multitudes. He went on a mountain. His disciples came to him. He opened his mouth, sat down, and taught them, saying, these are what your attitudes must be, the be attitudes. These are what your attitudes must be if you want to continue to be my disciples. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These are the beatitudes, what our attitudes are to be if we are to continue to be his disciples, not just learners, but followers of Jesus, if we are to survive being called into the beautiful, worthy difficulty of ministry. And we are all called into the beautiful, worthy difficulty of ministry. And it's entirely necessary to say to Jesus, if we don't see these in our life, I need your help. I need the help of the Holy Spirit so that I can continue to be your disciple so that I can continue to follow after you. And right in the midst of processing all of this, then he looks at us who feel ill-equipped, and he says, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world, and there's no plan B. So there's some urgency to this, right? Because if we are the only visible examples of disciples, if we are the only living epistles for the watching world who are wondering what this is all about to read and understand what it looks like to follow Jesus, then there's some urgency to us to have these attitudes in our heart and worked out through our life so that they're not just attitudes, not just understandings, but they follow suit in our actions. Remember, we've been saying these are what our attitudes and our actions must be if we are to be disciples of Jesus, if we are to be visible examples of what it looks like to follow Jesus and to learn of Jesus and to represent Jesus faithfully. So in the second part of the Sermon on the Mountain, he talked about our actions. And he said, well, first off, if you're going to represent me faithfully and accurately, stop calling people idiots and morons. Stop saying raka and you fool. Stop letting contemptuous anger bubble up in your heart so that it works its way out towards murder. It has to, it has to be stopped at the heart. You need a, a new heart because sin begins in the heart. And if you're to be the visible example of what it is to be a disciple, this is really important. Your actions must follow suit, not just your attitudes. This is the expectation for those of you who represent me if you want to continue to represent me must deal with contemptuous anger. And if you struggle with dealing with contemptuous anger, there's an urgency because we're the only visible example, right? We don't subcontract this to the religious, religious professionals. There are no religious professionals. There just aren't. It's us. No plan B. So we have to deal with contemptuous anger. How do we deal with it? 
Jesus, you have to do surgery on my heart. I need a new heart. You must be the great physician in my heart. Take this anger out of my heart. Replace it with steadfast love. So Jesus talks about not only our attitudes, but our actions. The second action he talked about for visible examples of what it is to be a disciple is lustful looks. It's important that that stops, that that stops, because that sin that begins in your heart will work its way towards an outward act, and you're just as guilty, just as culpable, just as accountable as if you did the outward act. So again, deal with sin where it begins. This is important for the visible examples of what it is to be a believer, for all disciples of Jesus who are learners and followers. Jesus, deal with my heart. These are what your attitudes and your actions must be. In the next section of this sermon, we see the attributes that must be, characteristics of disciples of Jesus. Not just attitudes, not just our actions, but what defines us. And we see three of those things today. Let's start at verse 33, and we'll read to verse 48. And we'll see all three, and then we'll go back, and we'll look at each one one at a time. So Matthew 5, verses 33 through 48, the attributes of disciples of Jesus. Verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, verse 43, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So it's important to say a few things. Jesus would never expect from us that which he didn't already intend to empower us to do. He equips the called. He doesn't call the equipped. Also, these are not complicated, lofty concepts. These aren't necessarily ideals to aim for but never actually reach. These, These are the bar for disciples of Jesus for learners and followers of Jesus. These are the expectations. These are the attitudes and the actions and the attributes, the expectations of those who would be, who would freely choose to be a disciple of Jesus, someone who learns from Jesus and someone who follows Jesus, someone who is a visible example of what it is to learn from Jesus and follow Jesus. Jesus expects his disciples to be honest. Jesus expects his disciples to have grit. 
Jesus expects his disciples to be more than a conqueror. Now, some of you who understand this process are getting really excited because if Jesus expects us to be honest, he's going to help us to be honest. If Jesus expects us to have grit, he's going to give us grit. If Jesus expects us to be more than a conqueror, he's going to give us the power of the Holy Spirit to actually be more than a conqueror. These are his expectations. We know this from the Old Testament. Every time God gave a commandment, his commandments were his enablings. He would never command us to do anything that he didn't already intend to empower us to do. So he wouldn't expect us to have any attribute in our life that he didn't already intend to empower us to do. But go back to that conversation with that person. This is the expectation. Are you unwilling or are you struggling and feeling unable? There's a difference. This is the expectation. So what happens when we hear the expectations, we clearly understand the expectations, and we just say, well, that's just not in me currently. I'm failing in this area. I'm falling short in this area. What do you do? Well, you don't do what we talked about last week. You don't minimize this. You don't rationalize falling short. You don't outsource this to religious professionals. You personally cry out to Jesus in your heart to work in your heart as the great physician because he can. And this is the only way that we will see these attitudes and these actions and these attributes is if we cry out to him. And yet at the same time, these remain the clear expectations for those who would claim to be disciples of Jesus. So there is some urgency, since we are the only visible examples of what it is to follow Jesus, to cry out to Jesus so that they, the watching world, could see these things in our life. These are the things that intrigue them. In a world full of lies, people that keep their word, in a world full of people just falling on the floor at the slightest breeze, people with grit to continue to do the good thing, in a world full of woe is me, woe is me, victim mentality, people that would actually love their enemies, this is like the burning bush. I don't get it, and I'm intrigued by it, so I want to go and see it more. And this is what the Holy Spirit does with us. He expects us to have these attitudes. He empowers us to have these attitudes. He expects us to have these actions. He empowers us to have these actions. He expects us to have these attributes. He will empower us to have these attributes, not as an effort of our human will, but as a work of his Holy Spirit. Uh, a dear friend sent a text early this morning asking how they could be praying for refuge, and they had a specific question the specific question was, what is your biggest prayer request for the church? And I responded to them this. And it might sound counterintuitive or maybe even a little counter to what we've been talking about so far. My response for the biggest prayer request for the church is this, that we would rest in the loving power of Jesus. That we would experience being carried along by the Holy Spirit that we would see all of this manifest in selfless love that glorifies our Heavenly Father. See, these things, attitudes and actions and attributes, don't come from trying harder. They also don't come from minimizing, rationalizing, or outsourcing this to religious professionals. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. There's no plan B. You are the living epistle. You are the visible example of what a disciple looks like. So hearing this and hearing this sermon of expectations, what do we do? We repent. We turn from trying harder and we receive help from the Holy Spirit. We rest in the loving power of Jesus and we experience being carried along by the Holy Spirit. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, we see all of this manifest in our lives and the lives of our brothers and sisters in a way that shows selfless love, in a way that intrigues the watching world, and in a way that glorifies our Heavenly Father, not by might, nor by power, but by His Holy Spirit. Not a work of the human will, but a work of the Holy Spirit, and yet, at the same time, expectations. So this is exciting for us. Jesus is going to empower us to do this. 
So three attributes today, characteristics of disciples of Jesus. Let's look at the first one again. Let's start with the attribute of being honest, forthright, sincere, plain spoken, direct, trustworthy. Look at verses 33 through 37. Matthew 5, verses 33 through 37. Verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So one of the Ten Commandments is this. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. What does it mean to take the name of the Lord in vain? Well, what does vain mean? What does in vain mean? It means useless, empty, no meaning, no likelihood of fulfillment. <laughs> useless, empty, no meaning, no likelihood of actually happening. Have you ever heard someone say, I swear to God, and no much further after the words come out of their mouth, you now know there's no chance of that actually happening. That's using God's name in vain. I swear to God I'm going to do this. It's empty. No chance of it actually happening. And it's, a, it's an empty promise with no real meaning. And so using God's name in vain is using God's name as a swear word. I swear to God. Now, some in this day and age thought, well, there's probably a problem with that. So we won't swear to God. We'll swear on the earth or we'll swear on Jerusalem or we'll swear on my own head. And we've all heard variations on this, right? I swear on my mother's grave. And Jesus says, hold on. Don't do any of that. Just let your yes be yes and your no, no. Because as soon as you say more than that, people inherently know that this has less likelihood of actually happening. Just be a, be a person who's known for following through with what they say they're going to do. Don't add anything else to this because anything else added to this, it's from the evil one. Just This is, this is the attribute I want to see in my disciples. This is the character traits I want to see in my disciples. This is what I long to see in those who represent me faithfully. Be men and women of your word. Just simply do what you say you're going to do. Don't add anything else to this. And if you haven't done this in the past, cry out to Jesus, repent, and start today. The first attribute in this section is honesty. The second attribute in this section is grit. Isn't that a great word? Grit. It actually has a dictionary definition. Want to hear it? Here's grit. Courage, resolve, strength of character, firmness of mind or spirit, unyielding courage in the face of hardship or danger. Don't you want to see this in followers of Jesus? Don't you want to see this in yourself? Don't you want to see courage and resolve as you serve Jesus? Strength of character as you serve Jesus? Firmness of mind or spirit with eyes fixed on Jesus. Unyielding courage to do the right thing no matter what the consequences are in the face of hardship or danger. This is something that Jesus wants to see too. This is something that Jesus expects from his disciples. And this is something that Jesus will empower his disciples to do. And he gives us some practical examples of what this looks like as we go on to be visible examples of followers of Jesus. In verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. 
If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Do you remember? We're the visible examples of what it is to be a disciple, and the world that's wondering if all of this is true is watching you. If someone came up to you and did something to you and then you did the same thing right back to them, is there any difference between you and the person that did something to you? No. So the watching world just goes, yep, that's the norm. But what happens when we do something different? You guys remember the Columbine shootings from years and years and years ago. There was a young girl named Rachel Scott who was specifically named by the two shooters because she had shared the gospel with them. They named her that they were going to kill her she was known for sharing the gospel, and not in some sort of you know, overt, obnoxious way, but in really simple, powerful ways. She was so outspoken, this young little girl, about Jesus, that one day in lunch, one of the jocks came up to her and poured out his whole like 32-ounce drink on her head and said, what are you going to do now, Jesus follower? And she got up, and she walked out of the cafeteria, and everyone thought she was walking out in embarrassment. You know what she did? She went over and with her own money bought another 32-ounce soda and brought it back to the very person that poured it on her head and said, I thought you might be thirsty. How do you stop someone like that? That's intriguing, isn't it? If you were watching that, wouldn't you want to know? Wouldn't you wonder what this little girl, what the strength that she has to do that? And if he poured it on her head, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and she just took hers and threw it in his face... Would the watching, wondering world see anything different than what the world does every day, all day? No. So Jesus is saying, this is what I want to see in you guys, and I'll empower you to do it. This is what I expect from you. Grit. Courage in the face of evil and adversity in such a way where it makes them wonder what's going on in your life. They do something to you, and they take something from you, and you give them more. Wait a second, that doesn't make sense. In this day and age, the Romans, by law, by Roman law, could come up to you and put their spear tip on your shoulder and compel you to carry all of their gear for one mile. And you know what people were used to seeing? Those who were under the Roman occupation just going, ah, I can't stand this. But for fear of dying, they would do this and they would carry it one mile. And Jesus is saying, make them scratch their heads. And when they compel you and force you to go one mile, look at them with sincere love and say, let's go too. And it makes them wonder, why are you doing this? And obviously, there are thousands of examples of how this grit can play out in your life. Now, the third attribute that Jesus wants to see, expects to see in his disciples is that of being more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. Look at verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only... What do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So in relation to those who curse us, who spitefully use us, who persecute us, how can we be different than what the world normally sees? What does the world normally see when someone is cursed or spitefully used, or persecuted. They see someone react with the same. They see someone escalate with more. But Jesus is saying, not only stand in the midst of it and offer them the other side, not only go two miles instead of one, but just stay there. Don't run. Don't run because you're scared. Run because you're remaining in love. 
and actually tangibly love even your enemies. Because you, you, you must know you have something that they don't have. You must have your love for them that I placed in your heart overwhelm your fear of them. I've given you great and precious promises like this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? We, this is what we signed up for. We knew this would happen to us. We face de- death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors through him who loved us. For we are convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we see someone spitefully use us or persecute us or or treat us poorly or treat us like an enemy, we are free from having that woe is me, woe is me, victim mentality. And Jesus expects us to repent of this mentality and to have an attribute where the watching world would see us be more than a conqueror, not just retaliating or returning what they're giving to us, but to be actively loving them, loving even your enemies. Now, back to the beginning, even the sermon before the sermon. How many of you guys were following along when I was talking about giving some you know, some consultations with some local nonprofits and some expectations of employment, and I saw a lot of heads going, yeah, yeah, tell these Gen Z guys they need to work, you know? And then I said, and it's just like how Jesus has some expectations for us. And then I saw you go, oh, man. (laughs) We don't have to continue to be his disciples. We have a choice. We could say, I'm unwilling. I don't want to do this anymore. What we don't have a choice to do is to minimalize, rationalize, and hide in plain sight. We don't have that choice. Because Jesus sees our hearts. So just make a decision. And I would venture a guess by you guys just being here today, this is what you want. You want to see these attitudes in your life. Cry out to Jesus until they are. You want to see these actions in your life or the opposite out of your life. Cry out to Jesus until you see them. You want these attributes to define you, that people would know you by these things. They would go, you know, Joe, he's honest. He does what he says he's going to do. You know, that guy, he's got grit. I saw someone treat him so poorly, and he just stood there, and he loved them. That's amazing. And Jesus will help us to do this. If these are the things that we want to see in the lives of our employees, how much more so would Jesus want to see these things in the lives of those who are the visible example of what it means to be his disciple? So we don't just rush through this or minimize it or rationalize it or outsource it or hide in plain sight. We are going to do business with Jesus and say, search me and know me. You're the one that wove me together in my mother's womb. You know every aspect of me. And I need your help, Jesus. I'm so thankful that you've given us this word today. Your word is living and active, not just information that cuts to the heart, but good word that falls on soil that can produce an explosion of life and in-season fruit. And we willingly subject ourselves to this week after week, morning after morning. Your word is not only a lamp unto our feet, your word is manna for our soul, food for our spirit power from God. Write your word upon our hearts, Lord. 
live these things out by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us your word today. We trust you. We rest in your power. We rest in your loving power. We long to be carried along by your Holy Spirit. We long to be living our lives in such a way, like a city on a hill, that the watching world would see and wonder and glorify our Father in heaven. This is our heart, Lord. That's why we're here. So do your work in your way. We surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen.